Hi guys, when we were talking about the 19th century, I mentioned a couple of names like John Keats, uh, William Bouguereau, and I said I'd talk about them uh, when we talked about beauty. So let's do that. Uh, so beauty, unlike the way we've been working, doesn't exist in any particular time period. It's a, a topic rather than a chronology. Um, so let's close up 19th and modern and instead come over here to et cetera and to topics and to aesthetics. So um, when we talk about art, we talk about aesthetics. And what is that? Let's define that. So aesthetics, a set of principles concerned with the nature and appreciation of beauty, especially in art. The branch of philosophy that deals with the principles of beauty and artistic taste. Aesthetic, concerned with beauty or the appreciation of beauty. A set of principles underlying and guiding the work of a particular artist or artistic movement. So we want to talk about art, we think about aesthetics, we want to understand what aesthetics is, and we notice that this word beauty comes up over and over. So let's think about this word beauty. So before we even dive into these questions about beauty, let me ask you, let me beg you, please do not say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, students love to say that. I'm sure it's probably true, but I don't think it means anything. If you think about all these cliches that sort of come almost slip out of our mouths without us even knowing what we're saying. You know, these cliches are all probably true. They probably originate because there's some truth to them. But as a thing becomes, is said over and over and becomes cliche, it's kind of like a piece of clothing that's just really glorious and beautiful and you love to wear it. And then you wash it a thousand times and all the life is beat out of it from that relentless wash cycle. And it, it, it's no longer a garment that's attractive or fun to wear. And... You know, you can have an idea that's truthful, but if you just keep chanting it over and over like a mantra, the, the truth tends to sort of bleed out of it. So when you find yourself saying something like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, you know, don't let that be the end of a discussion because you haven't really said anything. Instead, let that be an invitation to sort of pause and say, OK, well, wait a minute. W w what does that mean? What do I mean? What do I believe? And so instead of saying beauty is in the eye of the beholder, take that as an invitation to take that idea apart and consider it more deeply and, and try to understand the concept of beauty and your own attitudes and opinions about it. Okay, so here's a few key questions. Does beauty exist objectively in things or does it exist subjectively in the mind of the perceiver? Or do things possess objective qualities they give rise to a perception of beauty in the mind of all perceivers. Is beauty sensory beauty, beauty that comes in through the five senses? Is there such a thing as intellectual beauty or moral beauty? And if there is, does, th does sensory beauty lead like a ladder up to these higher forms of intellectual and moral beauty? Or is sensory beauty a distraction, a deception, taking us the wrong way? How does beauty relate to other values, to the useful, to the honorable, to the spiritual? Does beauty have a role in leading us to these concepts? And philosophers have had not just these two, but many other philosophers have had a lot to say about beauty. Um, I'll let you kind of take a look at this on your own because, again, we're as usual, as always, we're short on time. But I'll just say, you know, that for Plato is kind of the beauty exists objectively in things. Aristotle is kind of the subjectively in the mind of the perceiver. And then actually Kant is maybe closer to what we might say today about objective qualities giving rise to a perception of beauty. But let's, let's just dive in and look at some art. Um, or I guess first, let's, let's, let's um, so here, let's, let's consider the yin and the yang of, of John Keats and Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Um, okay, so uh, what's Keats got to say? So Keats, a romantic poet, um, his epic poem, Ode on a Grecian Urn, the concluding lines are this emphatic statement, beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. So there it is. Beauty is truth. That might take a little unpacking too, but let's just run with that for a minute. Let's follow this arrow over to someplace. So here we were with Keats up here around 1800. Let's go back a couple hundred years to Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. So Hamlet, you might recall, he sees his father's ghost and his father's ghost says that, no, I did not die of natural causes. I was actually murdered by my brother, 
your uncle Hamlet, Hamlet's uncle, um, who has now since then married the queen and is now the new king, the usurper king. And so Hamlet, looking at his, you know, horrible uncle, who, who's this just, you know, terrible, wretched person, but is so beautiful and, you know, celebrating before his court and the, the king and queen seem joyous and gay. And so Hamlet bitterly says of his uncle, oh, villain, villain smiling, damn villain. One may smile and smile and be a villain. So Keats has offered us that beauty is truth and Hamlet has offered us that beauty lies. That's act one, scene five. Later in our story, act five, scene one, um, Hamlet will have even more to say about this idea of beauty lying and the ephemerality of beauty. So I would read this if I didn't, wasn't in a rush, but go ahead and, and read and meditate on those concepts. But let's, um, let's march on uh, and think about some paintings. So this is Bouguereau, who I mentioned, this academic painter. Uh, here's his Birth of Venus. Um, Ven the Birth of Venus is a very pretty painting. Um, we might say it's beautiful, but... So here's Bouguereau's indigent family. This is basically Bouguereau's painting of homelessness. But you'll notice that this too is a fairly pretty painting. They don't look to be suffering too much. They have great dignity. Their clothes are actually pretty clean. And, you know, we might say that if this is homelessness, then I don't really have to worry about it. I can go on with my life. So this is actually a pretty convenient for me depiction of homelessness because it's, you know, it's not so horrible that I have to stop everything and worry about it. Um, and then here with this Venus, you know... I don't know anybody who lives like this. And if I lived in 1879, I probably wouldn't know anybody who lived like that then either. So um, if beauty is truth and nobody lives like this, then this very pretty painting doesn't really contain a lot of truth. So I can call it pretty, but can I call it beautiful if beauty requires some sort of truth? I don't know. Let's look at more art. So here's this painting, Olympia, that we've mentioned before. Um, painted by Edward Manet, the model who has such a powerful presence in the painting, Victorine Morent. And Charles Baudelaire, uh, the art critic, he was concerned about all of this type of stuff, these romantic paintings that, you know, were, you know, that, that Marie Antoinette let them eat cake when people are really struggling kind of thing. And so Baudelaire, you know, challenged artists to depict real life, contemporary life as actually lived by people. And these two paintings don't look all that different to our contemporary eyes. Olympia still looks pretty cheesecakey to us, but it is, in fact, both formally how it's handled and, um, you know, the way she's staring back at us in her pose. It is a coarser, um, perhaps a little bit more honest painting than this Bouguereau. So um, let's keep going. So here's Picasso, 1907, Demoiselles d'Avignon. Um, so these are street prostitutes. Picasso's kind of a womanizer, but it's 1907. There's no penicillin. So he's probably terrified of syphilis. And there you go. Um, you know, it's this beauty and terror and horror of the street. So this painting is certainly far less pretty than what we've been looking at. But there is, I, can't, I think, an, an honesty of, of Picasso's you know, conflicted relationship. Go a little more forward to Kooning, um, Woman and Bicycle, 1953. This is a pretty, you know, difficult painting. Like, what's wrong with this de Kooning guy? Well, I don't know. We're, you know, to, for us to understand de Kooning is going to take more than one painting. But even with just one painting, you know, we might be able to conclude that he, he must have had at least one bad relationship with some woman in his life. Because if all relationships he had had with women were beautiful and idyllic and pretty, um, he probably wouldn't make this painting. So this painting is far less pretty probably than these earlier works. But, um, you know, again, looking at these words from Keats, if beauty is truth, well, there isn't a lot of truth here, but there, you know, this more difficult painting does seem to have a sort of truth to it. So, you know, could the de Kooning, you know, I might argue that, that 
the Bouguereau is pretty, but the, the de Kooning has a truth, and maybe I'm going to call that beautiful then. It's a different definition than we're used to of beauty, but maybe it is. Um, and since we're looking at women, I thought I'd throw a few guys in. But um, uh, I also have, so if you're, if you're looking at aesthetics, here's our beauty node. And if you click this video link up here, I've got a number of videos that you might watch. They're all short pieces. You've probably seen the Dove Evolution piece, but it's, you know, this is interesting to think about the concept of beauty and, and how it connects with gender. So there's a few quick thoughts about beauty, much more to say and much that you can discuss in, in discussion.